Steve Coogan. Steve Coogan. Do you want? Do you can? You, if you've got a minute, you can Google him. I'll Google him. All right. Okay. I love Steve Coogan so much. I'm, Thanks. You're I'm, not so bad yourself. <laughs> Did you hear that? Yes. That's my Alexa. I wasn't talking to you. I was talking about Steve Coogan. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned Kenneth Branagh earlier. He told me he was on stage with an actor, I think Tom Hiddleston, and over Tom Hiddleston's shoulders, he can look into the wings and he sees the actress that's about to make an entrance and he sees her pass out. <laughs> Could you imagine? He tells a story in his autobiography about missing a... There's a very complicated business in, in Henry V, I think, with a, with a glove. And he's inspecting the dead on, of Agincourt. And then he finds a glove and talks to Lost about this thing, but the glove wasn't there. So he had to keep inspecting the dead with no lines. And then somebody, he could see in the wings going. <laughs> and then someone produced a sort of motorcycle, like a motorbike gauntlet. <laughs> and that came on stage and he did this whole thing. With... I did a little bit in Cinderella, his film, and, and I did a play with him, a farce, directed by Sean Foley, who you I worked with. I saw it, You came to see yeah. Well, yeah. and you remember Alex McQueen w was in that, playing my love rival, the, the psychiatrist. That's doctor, right. Remember? Well, That's right. we had a thing where Alex got um, food poisoning. So uh, in this play, it's a one-act play, Ken and I would be on the stage the whole time. It didn't come off. We were about to go on one night, and the company manager came up to us and said, oh, just Alex is projectile vomiting in his dressing room. So if he can't get on stage, so-and-so will take his place. And Ken cool as a cucumber, did not, he just, he just went, unless he physically cannot stand up, he will be on the stage. <laughs> so, so, then, what so, then, so then we go through the play now, Alex doesn't come on for about half an hour, and we get to this line, you may remember it. And I, you know this is coming, yes, this yes, terrible dread. Yes. Yeah. I've got to run upstage, this upstage door, i got to go, I'll go and get a doctor. I was playing Welsh, and yes. I opened the door, it is Alex, and he's white as a sheet, and he's sweating. And we end up doing, we have to do this sort of fight. And then he ends up on top of me on the bed, like straddling me with his face there. And then we freeze and the action goes to the other side. So when it freezes, I whisper to him, are you all right? And he went, oh. and he <laughs> over my face, he started to go, <laughs> He managed to hold it together, and we, we do the curtain call. We go off. We say, well done, Alex. And he went, yeah. Yeah. I remember you doing a thing for me once, and I'm hoping I'm going to be able to persuade you to do it now, of the actor in the wings who is bitching about an offer they've had. Do you <laughs> remember a, that? Yeah, that's, that actually is – that should be really attributed to Toby Jones. Okay, okay, okay. We sort of – Maybe we sort of invented it together, but it's the actor, yeah, it's the actor who misses their, because there's a tannoy running all the time, you know, in the theatre. And so you can hear the show on the relay. And so you get very good at hearing when your cue's coming. And also you get a call from the stage managers. And so, and so, but sometimes you forget and you're off and it's, the, it's just the worst thing in the world. So you're talking away saying, well, I'm not going to go down to Chichester for, you know, for that. And certainly not with Trevor. Uh, I'm not, I'm... Oh, no, it's fine. I can hear it. Uh, <laughs> and then you hear then, then you hear the actor going on stage and talking because they just sprinted from the dressing room in the middle of what you're saying there you, you, you touched on a tragedy which is of course dance was your life for, for, for so long tell us about the injury and, and the injury and what happened and what it was like when those dreams were shattered well they said it wouldn't hurt to sit on it and I made the mistake of doing it. It was part of the choreography. They said the, that my uh, jazz bells would, would hold. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, no, I went straight through, straight up, straight through and straight up, and I never walked really the same again. Certainly couldn't dance again. And it's meant that I know in a lot of that, I know with Frost Nixon you were keen to have a dance element in that, and I know they got... Yeah. Was it now, Bob? you joke about that. You joke about that, Rob. <laughs> But funnily enough, when we did the first ever read-through, not read-through, like a sort of workshop of Frost Nixon, the play, because it was a play before it was a film. And I remember I was doing, um, we were filming The Queen at the time, 
from the Queen, and Peter Morgan, who wrote the Queen, said, well, I've got this other thing I'm working on, you know, I'll, I'll send it to you. And um, so he sent it to me, and it was Frost Nixon, and it was the very beginnings of the play. When we did the first ever workshop reading of it at the Donmar Theatre, Douglas Hodge was Nixon. He was, you know, he was just helping out doing it for the day. And Frost had a song. <laughs> the first half ended with David Frost doing a song. So you joke about the dance element, um, but actually there was a, a, a number that didn't didn't make it into the uh, the ultimate rehearsal draft. You know, when we when we would work together, here's somewhere where we don't overlap. You would sometimes have those big headphones on, and I'd say, "What are you listening to, Nick?" And I'd have a listen. What do you call that god awful racket that you like listening to? That is called acid techno. Why? That is all I listen to in the whenever in the morning if I'm writing. I mean, I was brought brought up and when I was sixteen, I was going to the acid house parties right. in Essex, and that was where I began. You know, so I've always had a great love of acid house and 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 acid techno and kind of squat parties and that's that was kind of me but i think in this last year i got a diagnose uh being diagnosed with adhd i didn't know that and i didn't know that either but he, the guy who diagnosed me uh seemed to think that there is something about that repetition of acid techno which actually it makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 there's something about it which is actually very focusing. Yeah, and, yeah. and uh, it, it quite relaxing, really. Yeah, so, so, it's, so it's, it's, it's all... I'm going to sound like some old guy now, but it's all... Yeah. yeah? Wow. Yeah, there's a journey, there's a route to it. It all seems very, it all seems very logical to me. There's a path it takes. Yeah. And it, it builds to a crescendo... Uh, and then it breaks, and there's uh, uh, an upwelling of, of emotion and ecstasy, and then it goes grinding on again to another oh. inevitable build and break. So, so what are the consequences of being diagnosed with ADHD? Has, has it made sense uh, of lots of things then? Yeah, it did. I, there was always... Uh, I never realised that the things that were happening to me weren't happening to everyone else. I read a thing about you when I was doing a bit of research here that I couldn't believe. When you were at school, uh, you were head girl. Oh, um, actually, I was head girl of my junior school and I was head girl of my comprehensive school as well. Twice. All right, let, let me ask you, what was the talent pool like? I don't think that the talent pool was very big, but... I'm very good at, um, at I, I know I'm very good at doing a good talk and I'm good at auditions. And so I think even at that young age, I was already getting good at it. And I remember going in to talk to the headmaster and the deputies and everything and really being quite, right, these are the things that I'm going to do. I, want to, I don't want us, the girls to wear skirts anymore. We're going to have a choice. We're going to be this. We're gonna... I was full of all of my ideas, gave a really, really good talk. And out of all of them, I think the only thing I did was get us all to wear trousers. And after that, I was sort of over it then. I was a bit like, oh, I'm a bit bored now. So I don't think I actually did anything else after that. But I do remember the girls fighting. It was such a rough school. And I remember the girls fighting. And it was like St. Trinian's. I remember at one time being the head girl and keeping a lookout for the teachers as there was a circle forming with girls. And then these other two girls were like really fighting in the middle. One of them had her shirt pulled up over her head. She carried on fighting. The other one got three scrams, like claw marks down her face. And as head girl, my job was sort of like to keep a lookout. And then go, they come in, they come in, the teachers are coming. And then everything was dispersed. Now can you see why I was the head girl? No, because your role as head girl, let's be very clear. If there's a fight, the head girl's role is not to keep an eye out for the teacher. You're meant to be on the side. You're the snitch. I think you misread the whole thing. Because <laughs> when I saw you doing your interview with Ruth, did she say she was head girl in there? Well, well, no, I no head Ruth head wasn't head girl. She was, she was. She's got a badge or something. Yeah, lost, never. Last year, I've seen an interview with Ruth on um, the internet, and, um, and she's shown her head girl. On the internet. On the internet. <laughs> it wasn't on the television, was it? It was, it was on the internet. You didn't read it in a book, did you? <laughs> or was it in a paper, perhaps? Did you hear somebody saying it in the street? 
or did you see it written on the floor? <laughs> no, you saw it on the internet. Yeah, and uh, and she's got a head girl badge. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that Ruth was head girl. And then I thought, oh, well, I've been head girl twice. Now, <laughs> while we're on music, I don't know if you've told this story publicly, but you told it to me. Uh, Bruce Springsteen is one of the great loves of my life. And you I mean, had an experience. I mean, well, I was doing a gig in, this was in New York about maybe two years ago. And it was the, uh, it was Stand Up For Heroes. So it was, it was a gig where not only did you do the gig to benefit the charity that helps ex-servicemen, but there's quite a lot of ex-servicemen that come. Some of them have been very seriously injured. And it's a really lovely charity. And the, the, it, it's always run the same way. It's at Madison Square Gardens, uh, Bruce Springsteen headlines, and there's five comics on. And little old Jim, I was in town, and they said, well, why don't you go up and do 10 minutes? I said, my pleasure. So we're playing Madison Square Gardens, which is quite trippy anyway. I mean, it's quite fun because you're, you're in this incredible room, right? And we're in a smaller room downstairs. So it's like a four and a half thousand, five thousand seater. We get there early, you know, with the suit bag and the thing. And the guy on the door, Mr. Kai, you know, they've got the pictures up so they recognize you. So go upstairs, walk straight into the green room. As I'm, as I'm walking in there, facing the wall in double denim, looking at something on the wall, it's the boss. And I'd just done Desert Island Discs like two weeks before. Anyway, so I see the button, I went, oh, listen to your Desert Island Discs, I thought it was great. I like the way you picked this, I, did that. I read the biography and the bit where you talk about your father's clothes and the fact that you wore the same clothes that he went to work in when you go to work. And anyway, I'm kind of chatting away to, I mean, it's Bruce Springsteen and I'm on send. I'm like 20 minutes just chatting to the guy. And, he's, oh, right, okay. and as I'm chatting away, I kind of look over his shoulder and I see on the open door, it says Bruce Springsteen. And in an instant, my stomach goes, oh. I realize, and then I ask anyway, even though I know the answer, I go, is this, is this the green room or your dressing room? And he goes, it's my dressing room. And I went, oh. I'd like, I've opened a drink. I mean, I'm eating. I'm well, you took, you took his stuff and you started having yes. his stuff. Yes, I've, I've, I've got like a. I've got like a fizzy water and, a, and I'm eating carrots. Oh, boy. Like, give a fuck about this. I'm like, cool. <laughs> in, I've just walked in a stranger. I've thrown my bags in the corner. I've thrown my bags down on the chair. I'm just chatting away to this guy. He's got no choice in it at all. I mean, his life has been on the road. This is his home, ostensibly. I've wandered into. I went, I should probably go. And he went, yeah. <laughs> For the rest of the day, the nice thing was my dressing room was sort of next door and we get myself kind of a bit, a little bit humiliated, but like, no, nah, it's fun. Um, and then for the rest of the day, because I was there at like five o'clock and he was doing his sound check. So I went down to watch him sound check, which was magnificent with his wife, who has this voice of an angel. I mean, just cuts through you. Yeah. And so all the time I was kind of wandering past his dressing room a lot. So he's like strumming away and I was just sort of nodding my head in and going, practice makes perfect. Okay. <laughs> And then he, I, was, I said, what songs are you doing? And he, sort of, he said, I'm, I'm, I, he said, I'm going to do four songs. And I said, you're going to do your own or covers? <laughs> and he said, I'm going to do my own stuff. And I went, it's just, and he laughed. I mean, he was like, you know, but, and incredibly, for, for, I mean, obviously he maybe appreciate I was doing the gig or whatever, but what a gent. And could have been a dick about it, would have been well within his rights. I didn't. I forgot from when you saw me before that you were tucking into the dips and the tricks. I thought it was the green room. It looked like a green room. Let's talk about uh, a couple of times that uh, people won't know this, that, that you and I have performed together. <laughs> Your wedding, you, you had a lovely wedding over in Ireland. Claire and I came and I think I made a, a, a little speech at the reception, didn't I? Yeah. Right, I did, did that. And then you, you yeah. ha had the band. So you got you got the phonics there with you, obviously, and yeah. you also had Ronnie Wood and Paul Weller. I did, yeah. <laughs> and you were the Tom Jones because Tom couldn't make it. Tom couldn't make it, so so you with that lineup did some songs, right? And and we're in a yeah. beautiful marquee, but it's it's a wedding reception, you know. And you got all you guys up there. Well, this is great. And then you called me up, so because it was a little stage, so Paul Weller has to leave the stage to make way for me. 
And then we do the song and it's great fun. And, and I look across what you're in the guitar. So, and there's Ronnie bloody Wood playing. And then we do it. And then as I go off the stage for Paul Weller to come back on, as I go off, he says to me, he looks at me, he goes, he goes, you haven't lost it, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, you talk about surreal moments. I, I just thought... Oh, well, mate, that was surreal for me just looking around it. When I saw the, the pictures of that thing, it's just ridiculous because you know, as a kid, the jam, and, and obviously the Rolling Stones and the faces, for them to be in my wedding. I always remember the story. Everybody was saying that when everybody got off the plane that day and there's a car hire place outside and the guy was wondering what the fuck was going on because <laughs> Ronnie Wood walked in, then Paul Weller walked in. <laughs> And he's like, what's going on here? Another of my guests on here, the brilliant Matthew McFadden, told a story of you maybe on stage doing Henry V and a glove. Does mm. that ring any bells? I did have an experience. Uh, it was on the first performance of Henry V at Stratford. There's a very key part of plot, which involves actually the actor Sean Prober, uh, who played Fluellen, the Welsh captain in it. Uh, who has an argument in the nighttime scene. The night before the battle, he argues, uh, he and Michael Williams, a character played in the film by Michael Williams, Judy Dench's uh, late husband, uh, uh, they argue and uh, they exchange gloves with the promise that if the battle is successful and they come up against each other again, uh, they'll fight. It does depend on the actor playing Henry V retaining the glove. Uh, I was unable to retain the glove. Uh, you talked about uh, drying. Well, that was a big dry and a big pile of old Shakespearean Coswell. Uh, because once I realized after the battle, very touching moment of the, the sea, the stage is full of, you know, the, the fallen. It's very, very sad. And we're about to change tone. Shakespeare's now been sad for long enough. He wants to laugh. So he wants the glove back out and the nice payoff to the Michael Williams confrontation couldn't find a bloody glove so that's when a lot of ah oh, my liege does thou remember i recall it seems to me last eve and last eve of all that was betwixt the night and morn the moon shone bright that night a pair of gloves if faith it, it, it were here or twas there perhaps tis around the stage in now very now very now a pair of gloves oh gloves if thou dost find them bring them to me bring them now now very now by that stage first performance of many things the adrenaline I was working on was through the yeah. roof. I was 23 years old and mad as a box of frogs. We didn't have, we hadn't had a dress rehearsal. You're following in the footsteps of people like, oh, you might have heard of this guy, Richard Burton, who <laughs> played it at Stratford upon Avon. Thank God for the adrenaline because it allows you to make up stupid lines about gloves. I thought I had got away with it, and then I was walking back to my digs at Stratford that night. Car pulled up, it was about midnight, wound the window down, went, Love the gloves, by the way. Love the gloves, very nice, very new, wasn't expecting it. 